Well, you can think of it as a, uh, you can think of the now as a kind of uh, laser which is moving over a larger surface and illuminating it, you know, scanning it. It's scanning something and it takes it a while to scan it and then at the end all the data is in place and then you say, oh yes, I see now what the object of cognition was and we, our faith is, and there's no reason to doubt it, that this is a great transcendent experience. This is the resolution, uh, the peace that passeth understanding as you sink into death. It's just that we like to think that the psychedelic experience gives us a preview. No one escapes, you know, the final realization. It's just that some people do postpone it to their last act. But there's no reason for that because it is the, the mystery, the culmination, it is the date palm and the wellspring. I'd like to... Uh I'm always interested in pursuing things from the Mayan angle, so I'd like to ask about how this theory of time relates to the individual. It's somewhat related to BJ's question. There's some sense I have that um, in their techniques, and certainly you've experienced and other people have experienced this with the mushroom at, at uh, high doses, of um, traveling through time and actually seeing the future or seeing the past and I, I was wondering if you could say more about that and, and uh, some framework for understanding how that is possible. Yes, well, I think psilocybin seems to be the great teacher of history and wants, and, and part of its teaching is history. It views a person without a history as a person with amnesia, you know, a person with a diminished capacity because your history gives you the power of your convictions. Uh, the way I use the wave, or the way I've been using it recently, is to try and study the time immediately ahead of us so that we don't misjudge what's going on. And, uh, you know, it's a mathematical process. There's no indeterminacy about it if we anchor the whole wave system on 2012. And what I see from that anchorage, anchorage point is uh, in the 67 year cycle from 1945 to 2012 we have reached that point which resonates with the larger 4,306 year cycle at that point which corresponds to the collapse of the Roman Empire around 475 AD. In other words, uh, we, are, we have been through a period of imperialist expansionism which has lasted for a number of years, certainly since the beginning of the 80s. But I see a retrenchment of that and a, a, uh, a uh, recidivist tendency, a tendency toward religious fundamentalism, rigid social structures, and in short, the sorts of things which could be seen as valid resonance patterns uh, to the early medieval phase of European civilization. The period from uh, A.D. 474, let's for shorthand call it 500 A.D., the period from 500 A.D. to 1500 A.D., in other words, to the discovery of the New World by Columbus, that thousand-year period is the, is the resonance that we are going to experience from now to the late 90s. Around 1998, we will reach the beginning of the Renaissance and the discovery of the New World. But we are going to have to endure a period not entirely to our liking. We represent the pagan Hellenistic spirit which has held full sway within the empire for the past 25 years. And we may feel constricted now, but I think that our ideas and our uh, position in society has further constriction to undergo before it reflowers uh, downstream a bit. 
So when I first realized that, I felt very pessimistic. Mm. But then I asked myself, well, what aspects of medieval life uh, could I groove? What aspects of, of that medieval eschatology were solitary to my needs and wishes? And I discovered that, you know, it was an age of great mystical faith and illumination. Oh. It was an age of... Uh, communities of like-minded people seeking transformation mm. far from the turbulence of the collapse of the empire. So uh, I, I, th I am not of that scoop. My theory leads me away from those people in the New Age who think we're about to be catapulted into the corridors of power. I think that's preposterous, and the evidence for it is zero. And uh, I think better we should tend our gardens and uh, form brotherhoods and sisterhoods of affinity and realize that the task of transformation is one of a lifetime, our lifetimes, you know? And every time someone like... Uh, Dick Price or Tony Lilly moves from the wheel, I always wonder, you know, how did it feel to know it wasn't finished? You mm. know, to go with it undone. And, uh, oh yes, I have no doubt that when the saucer comes that Tony or Dick will be in control. <laughs> One of them. <laughs> what is it uh, Bob Dylan says in his song, Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot fighting in the captain's tower? Um, but yes, so, so I don't know if that answered your question, Robin, but I wanted to, to get it in because the real... Uh, the real meat for most people for this idea about time is not the mathematics of it that and the symmetry of it that's only pleasing to a certain mentality but really what does it tell us about the years immediately ahead and what it says is you know consolidation illumination community and uh, self-discipline the essence of Tao is the correct apperception of process that's what Taoism is, is to understand process, is to be a Taoist. And I think that this is almost a formal rendering of the notion of Tao, almost an effort to create a, a mathematics, a, an algebra of the Tao. And as long as it's true to the notions which Taoism conserves, which is of flow and determinacy within indeterminacy, uh, it, it serves. This is what understanding time is, is to understand process, but to understand it so well that it's like a sense for you. It's like seeing. This is the kind of seeing that is uh, very important, to see into time. It's what history and culture have experimented with, but it's what we now, by identifying that as what is going on, can accelerate uh, much faster. Well, I'm not sure exactly what he meant by talking about the other. I mean, the other is just a way of thinking about all of these things that we name spirit, God, demon, void. It's that there just necessarily is a place off our map. Whenever you have a map, it implies the part that is not on the map. And the other, the truly other, is... Uh, it lies outside the domain of language. It's like the unspeakable. All you can do is point at it, you know. And uh, the Gnostic idea of God was that it was totally other, that there was nothing in this universe that gave any clue whatsoever as to the nature of God, that that was its essence, was to be completely other. But, you know, the other trickles through and reverberates in our lives in all kinds of dimensions. I mean, the first other that you meet is the world. And uh, at a later point in your development, your attachment to another human being can be, become a confrontation with the other. So it's just a way of shorthand signifying 
right? <laughs> the, the dimension that carries you beyond yourself into the things that you previously couldn't uh, expect or imagine. Yeah, that's one notion of it. Or Wittgenstein's unspeakable. Or, uh, you know, I always, I'm fond of quoting this poem by Trumbull Stickney where he says, I lean over your meaning's edge and feel the dizziness of the things you have not said. That's the other. It's the dizziness of the things unsaid, the things that lie beyond the edge of meaning. <laughs>